tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. The search for Chandra Levy and the tragic discovery of her body has riveted a nation, but she was not the first government intern to disappear. 15 months earlier, Joyce Chung vanished from the same neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Some believe that the similarities in their cases may be far more than a coincidence. Could a serial killer be on the loose in our nation's capital? A rape victim turns her own personal tragedy into an amazing ability to sketch criminals from eyewitness accounts. Police hope that her drawings will lead to the capture of these two men wanted for kidnapping. An escaped convict on a self-proclaimed mission from God stalks abortion clinics across the country. Authorities fear he will kill before they can return him safely to custody. Through a bizarre set of events, Diana and Deborah Cordova were separated from their mother, Patty, when they were three and five years old. Forty years later, Patty is still searching for them. Could you be the link to reuniting this family? Join me for these intriguing stories and more on another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. The entire country was saddened by the heartbreaking disappearance and death of Capitol Hill intern Chandra Levy. As pictures and home videos of the vivacious brunette flooded into our homes, the sense of tragedy only deepened. You Americans when news reports romantically linked Chandra to California Representative Gary Condit, he immediately came under this suspicion. But the congressman was ruled out as a suspect. 13 months after Chandra vanished, police were summoned to a remote section of Rock Creek Park, four miles from her apartment. A hiker's dog uncovered a human skull halfway down a heavily wooded incline, far away from the commonly used paths. Police found additional bones, a jogger's bra, and cassette player in the dense foliage. Dental records confirmed that the agonizing search for Chandra Levy was over. The manner of death has been ruled a homicide, but the cause of death could not be determined from the skeleton. What exactly happened to Chandra remains a mystery. Few people know that another one-time Washington, D.C. intern, Joyce Chung, mysteriously disappeared two years before Chandra. Although there was no romantic scandal and no national media coverage, the eerie similarities between the two cases are striking. The two women lived in the same neighborhood and had worked for the same government agency. They also shared numerous physical characteristics. A contentious debate has erupted over whether there is a connection between Joyce and Chandra. When Chandra Levy disappeared, it certainly brought back a lot of memories. And we wondered if there was a connection. That question remains open, and the question of Joyce's disappearance remains open. To those who ask whether or not there is a relationship between the missing person, Chandra Levy, and the missing person's Joyce Chang, I will tell you, they're totally unrelated. I strongly believe that these particular incidents involving these two women may have been committed by the, the same perpetrator, simply because of the, there's just too many similarities in this, in this case to, to ignore. To Joyce's family and friends, the similarities between Chung and Levy cases are alarming. Both were government interns who lived within three blocks of each other and both were attractive, young, brunette women of petite stature. Police dismiss these connections as mere coincidence. They've even suggested that Joyce may have committed suicide, but many adamantly disagree and believe a frightening question must be asked. Is a serial killer preying on the young female interns of our nation's capital? Joyce was the only daughter in a tightly knit Taiwanese-American family 
While in college, she served an internship for Representative Howard Berman of California. She had a wonderful personality. She was just very cheerful. She'd light up a room, that kind of a person. I mean, she was just adorable and smart. Everything you'd want your daughter to be. Following her internship, Joyce took a job as a lawyer at the INS. She lived with her brother Roger in the DuPont Circle area of Washington, D.C. Chandra Levy would later move to the same neighborhood. A favorite hangout for both was a nearby Starbucks coffee shop. It was here on the night of January 9, 1999, that Joyce was last seen. I know about you guys, but I ate way too much. <laughs> Earlier in the evening, Joyce had met up with several friends for a movie and dinner. Bye. At about 8.15, my sister was with uh, her friend Kathy. Kathy had generously offered to give her a ride home, but Joyce asked to make one quick stop at the Starbucks uh, to grab a cup of tea. Night. Joyce told her friend she would walk the four blocks home from the coffee shop. She never made it to her apartment. When Joyce failed to return home, her brother Roger called the authorities. I always report a missing person. Because Joyce was a federal employee, the FBI took the lead in the case. It's spelled C H I. I tried to stay positive at first, but as time went on, it was harder and harder to stay positive. I'd say after probably two or three days, we were sure that that at the very least, foul play was involved. But the FBI's initial investigation turned up nothing. There was no information available at that point to indicate that there was any foul play involved in terms of why she may have turned up missing, and there was no indication of where she may have gone. Then, spurred by local media coverage, a couple came forward with the first clue in the case. Joyce disappeared on January 9th. On January 10th, a couple was walking through Anacostia Park and had found a billfold with Joyce's government credit card and had turned that into the park police. But the credit card remained in the lost and found for four days until the couple recognized Joyce's picture in news broadcasts and contacted the FBI. Fearing valuable time had been lost, a 57-member search and rescue team scoured the area where the card was found. Other personal items belonging to Joyce soon turned up on the banks of the Anacostia River. Her apartment keys, her video rental and grocery store card, her gloves. Got a jacket over here. And the jacket Joyce was last seen wearing, there was a clean rip running down the back. Her coat torn down the back, her card scattered every place. We're just terrified. We know she's dead. You know, you don't want to confront it, but you know something horrible has happened to her. Police searched the river to no avail. Then three months later, a canoeist was paddling more than eight miles downstream from where Joyce's personal items were discovered. The spring rains had forced a body to the shore. Three months submerged in the water had taken its toll on the corpse. DNA tests were necessary to identify it as Joyce Chung. That's when all hope just dashed that, um, that Joyce was alive. And I quickly called my mother, one of the most difficult phone calls I've ever had to make, to tell my mother that her daughter was dead. And that's a moment that I'll never forget. Even worse for the Chung family was the medical examiner's official findings. The massive decomposition made it impossible to find out how Joyce died. As a result, the cause of death was listed as undetermined. Without any evidence of foul play, investigators felt there was nothing more to be done. Despite being unresolved, the case was closed. From a law enforcement perspective, there's no more investigation to conduct based upon the medical examiner's uh, opinion as to how she may have perished. For the police department to say they, they, they cannot continue an investigation because they can't determine the cause of death is totally ridiculous. 
It's incompetence for them to say that, to stop investigating a case because they can't determine the cause of death. It seemed no one would ever know what really happened to Joyce Chung. Then in May of 2001, Chandra Levy's disappearance drew renewed media interest in Joyce. To many, similarities between the two were chilling. They both worked for congressmen at one time, and interesting enough, uh, Chang worked for Representative Berman, whose office was basically adjacent to Representative Condens. They lived within uh, a few blocks of each other. They both liked to frequent the Starbucks coffee shop. Had the same types of friends. But the police response to questions linking Levy to Joyce Chung shocked Joyce's friends and family. For the first time publicly, they suggested that Joyce might have committed suicide. This is a woman without a history of depression. This is a woman who worked very hard in life and had everything to live for. And, the only, and it's just not a theory that makes sense. And it's very frustrating because Joyce and her family have lost so much. And to lose who she is by saying she was someone who committed suicide, I think, is, is, a, is another injustice to her. As you can see, there's a tear in the back of this jacket, which we haven't been able to determine the cause of yet. It's possible that- If Joyce did commit suicide, why was her jacket ripped? Unusual for a jacket to tear in this why were her personal items left on the banks of the Anacostia? And how did she get to the riverbank, approximately five miles from where she was last seen? She didn't have a car, and no public transportation goes there. And on a extremely freezing cold day in January, commit suicide by wading into the Anacostia River and putting her head under the water. That is patently absurd on its face. If you're gonna commit suicide, I guess you jump in the river thinking that I don't wanna get my blockbuster video card wet. Joyce Chang was murdered, period. She didn't commit suicide. There is another foreboding clue that some believe disproved suicide. Just three days after Joyce was last seen at the coffee shop, a bizarre statement appeared on a nearby wall. It read, good day, JC. May I never miss the thrill of being near you. Just the initials JC, which are the same initials as my sister's name, and the content of the message, may I never miss the thrill of being near you, is all just a little too weird, a little peculiar. It's very eerie that there's this, this graffiti, perhaps a perpetrator may have written that, or somebody who knew something. Was this a cryptic message from Joyce's killer? Perhaps he targeted her in the neighborhood and later spotted Chandra Levy in the same area when she arrived in town. There is one last disturbing revelation. There are those who believe that the serial killer has taken not two, but three lives. Five months before Joyce disappeared, 28-year-old Christine Mirzayan was raped and murdered while walking home from a barbecue. She shared a number of startling similarities with Joyce and Chandra. All three women lived in the DuPont area. All three women had dark hair. All three women were about the same height. And uh, they were all here uh, as interns at one point in their careers. There are no similarities in those three cases, period. I don't think any of us will ever know what happened to Joyce Chang. That case is currently in a closed status. There is no new information out there to indicate foul play was involved. I think the bottom line is somebody knows something and then maybe they'll see this and realize that there are still people who care and still want to know what happened to her and maybe they will come forward and, and tell us. We haven't completely gone on with our lives and forgotten about Joyce.
One of the most important members of police investigation teams is a sketch artist. The ability to transform eyewitness descriptions from victims into lifelike portraits of suspects is an exceedingly rare talent. Among the nation's top sketch artists, one in particular stands out. The eerily accurate drawings of Lois Gibson of Humble, Texas, have resulted in the arrest of nearly 1,000 criminals. But Lois' story goes far beyond artistic talent. She has overcome great personal pain with immeasurable courage. For Lois was herself the victim of a vicious crime. This is really easy. I do this with little bitty kids. Little bitty babies. Yeah, five-year-old. Really? Yeah. Lois Gibson, a 51-year-old mother of three, has been a police sketch artist for the last 20 years. Today, she's going to use her astonishing skills to help Denise Barnett. Denise was recently a victim of a brutal sexual assault, and she needs Lois's help. Now for the easy part, just relax. To be able to look through the eyes of the victim, I think you have to have a lot of empathy. You have to be in their shoes, and I've gotten real good at that, and uh, I empathize greatly. She eased my mind and said it was gonna be easy and wouldn't be very long, and, and that uh, she's done sketches with four and five-year-old little children. And it kind of shocked me to see uh, the actual face, that that's the guy. Police hope that Lois's sketch will lead to the apprehension of Denise's assailant. If the past is any guide, the chances are good Yet the drawing would not exist at all if Lois had not turned her yeah, own nightmare you know into a passionate desire for justice. The year was 1971, and 21-year-old Lois Gibson was living a life that seemed like a fairy tale. The striking brunette was riding a wave of success as a model in Los Angeles, and her acting career was starting to take off. Is it for television or for film or what? But on one quiet summer evening, a knock on the door would herald the end of Lois's dreams. Well, the pay's good enough, you know, I can go with that. Hey, listen, can I call you back as soon as at my door? Okay? All right, bye. Yeah, who is it? A man, pretending to be Lois's neighbor, gained entry to her home. Who are you? Hey, it doesn't really matter. Wait, who, who are you? Looks like you need a little company. He immediately started choking me. He went to my throat and just almost snapped my head off. The assailant sexually assaulted Lois and nearly strangled her to death before fleeing. The savage assault left Lois overwhelmed with shame. I was so destroyed, I couldn't even walk out of my apartment. And the idea that I would actually tell anybody was ridiculous. It was absurd, it was undoable. It was patently embarrassing. It was the most embarrassing, humiliating, painful thing I'd ever had happen to my, myself. Six weeks later, an amazing coincidence set Lois on the long road to recovery. I drove up the street that I didn't mean to drive up. And then when I got to the top of this winding hill, I looked on a balcony, on, and I saw the guy that attacked me. Right, because you are taking them away. And I started to scream, and then I realized his you hands were bad. behind his back, right. and he was cut. Look at everybody. What are you looking at? And I loved it. It was like I got to see justice. And that's when I fell in love with what police do. You don't have nothing on me. You're coming down on me. Lois like later something. learned from the police that the rapist was arrested for cocaine possession. She could still not bring herself to tell the authorities what the man did to her. But what happened that morning would change the direction of Lois's life forever. Following her attack, Lois Gibson moved to San Antonio, Texas, married and had a family. Lois continued to keep her agonizing memories to herself. Fortunately, she found an outlet that brought her some peace of mind, art. Using chalk, pastels, and charcoal, Lois began drawing portraits of her family. On Saturday, I did 15 sketches in one day. But something happened in 1980 
that convinced Lois she could no longer hide from her past. And I was over visiting my girlfriend, Diane Denton, and they came on the news talking about a dance instructor who had been raped in front of her 11 and 12 year old students. My God, that's horrible. How could anybody do something like that? So I had these vicious feelings. I couldn't stand it. And then all of a sudden, in less than a second, it hit me. And I told her, Diane, I could draw that guy. That would help the cops catch him. And if they did, I knew in my mind I didn't tell her. That would make me healed. That would heal up my bad feelings from my attack. But Lois realized she needed to prove to herself and the police that she could draw someone solely from an eyewitness description. So her friend Diane went to a nearby gas station, looked at the attendant, then returned to describe the man to Lois. And all of a sudden, I started reliving my attack, and I realized I needed to be able to do this really bad, and that it was going to kill me if I couldn't do it. Lois fought back her fears and drew the picture. The two brought the sketch to the gas station and compared it with the attendant. It matched perfectly. After some initial skepticism, the Houston Police Department decided to give Lois a shot. The results were astounding. Her startlingly accurate drawings have helped capture suspects in 30% of the cases she's worked, an arrest rate unmatched by almost all other sketch artists. The drawings that Lois uh, has done in the past for us uh, have proven to be extremely accurate. It is almost uncanny the resemblance that the composite carries to the actual physical appearance of the individuals that we have arrested. Many times it has been the turning point in being able to uh, find the individuals. Lois's sketches are, are significantly different from the ones that you traditionally see. There's a three-dimensional depth there. I believe that Lois has the ability to connect somehow with the people she's working with. It's like Lois is seeing the suspect just the way the victim did. Currently, Lois is working several cases for local police departments in Texas. One such case involves Jason Bomer and his brother, Philip. The two men were recently kidnapped from a mall in Humble, Texas. On February 25th, Jason and Philip Bomer were shopping for bed sheets when they were approached by two well-dressed African-American males. Gentlemen, gentlemen, oh, excuse us, oh, excuse us, oh, 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 oh. how you guys doing? Okay. They seemed friendly enough, so we, we started talking to them. They started asking if we want to buy a computer. Started thinking about it. My girlfriend was asking me for a computer, so I was like, I don't know, I'll check it out, see what's up. According to Philip and Jason, the men led them to a van in the mall's parking lot. But instead of a cheap computer, the brothers got a heart stopping shock. Get in the van! Get in the van! Get in the van! Get in the van, get in the van. Get in the van. right now! At gunpoint, Jason was forced into the back seat of the van and Philip into the front. The kidnappers then headed for the freeway. Yeah, you boys got some money? Huh? Man, we ain't got no money. You boys got something? A lot of stuff goes through your mind when you're sitting there with a gun at you. How are you going to get out of the situation or what? That's basically the main thing that was in my head. How am I going to get out of this? As the van approached 70 miles per hour, the brothers became convinced they were going to die. Both felt there was only one course of action. Hey, 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 what are you doing? The brothers hit the freeway shoulder with devastating force. Philip suffered cuts and asphalt burns from head to toe. Jason's collarbone was shattered and his legs severely fractured. Shortly after being released from the hospital, Jason Bulmer sat down for a session with Lois Gibson. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pick out different eyes. 
When I talked to Jason, he gave me the same spiel that every single witness gives me. Every single witness is positive they can't do the sketch. And I said, hey, it's not your problem. It's my problem. You just relax. These eyebrows here. Um, What's the letter and number underneath? B111. I tell the witnesses immediately that I, someone tried to kill me for fun, so I understand. Okay. And they always like hearing that. Uh, my attack has turned into a tool to relax my witnesses and help them get justice. Police are seeking these two men in connection with a kidnapping and attempted robbery of Jason and Philip Bomer. Authorities are also looking for a suspect in the assault on Denise Barnett. Denise was allegedly lured by this man to a remote field and raped. He is described as Hispanic, five feet eight inches tall, and approximately 140 pounds. After robbing a gas station, two suspects lead police on a high-speed chase through the back roads of Kentucky. The pursuit, which tops speeds of 120 miles per hour, abruptly ends when the suspects decide to flee on foot. Twenty-three-year-old Jason Miller is immediately apprehended. Hands above your head. But the second suspect, Clayton Wagner, somehow manages to slip through the police cordon. Authorities grow increasingly alarmed when they discover what Clayton Wagner left behind in his truck. In the vehicle was gas cans, half filled with gasoline, a dummy hand grenade, and firearms and a list of uh, abortion clinics on the East Coast. Clayton Wagner is a small-time career criminal who's apparently embraced the militant anti-abortion movement. A skilled survivalist who's eluded police on numerous occasions, Wagner has publicly stated that he is on a mission from God to kill abortion providers. So far, he has not acted on this threat, but authorities believe it's only a matter of time before Clayton Wagner attempts murder. Clayton Wagner is a very complex and intelligent individual. He's a woodsman. He used to own a computer company. He's a car thief. He's an armed robber. And at some point in his life, uh, uh, Clayton Wagner became involved in the anti-abortion movement. According to statements made by Wagner, he experienced a spiritual awakening shortly after his daughter had a miscarriage. The family held a service for the unborn child. Clayton Wagner has spoken to a reporter from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on numerous occasions. Wagner said that at one point he heard a voice he takes this to be the voice of God, but he said God told him, how can you mourn so much over this one child when so many others are being killed? And it, it all seems to start right there. In the ensuing months, Wagner reportedly used his computer skills to compile a list of abortion clinics and their employees. Armed with surveillance equipment, police scanners and firearms, Wagner claims to have stalked over 100 clinics in 19 states. He had been out for a time stalking abortion clinics and uh, trying to work up the nerve to shoot an abortion doctor or one of their staff members. He had people in his gun sights at least three times and couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. God's will, as Clayton perceived it, had not been carried out. A despondent Wagner allegedly vowed that next time, an abortionist would die. But then the law interceded. The motor home Wagner was traveling in with his wife and eight children 
broke down just inside Illinois. When a license plate uh, check was done, it revealed that the motorhome was stolen. We had a little problem earlier with the, the starter, I think, is what... Uh... When Illinois State Police troopers indicated to him that he was going to have to conduct an interview with Wagner's family... Go there and talk to your wife or something. Me uh, you do under... me a favor, just don't drag her in. She doesn't know anything. And at that point, Wagner uh, immediately volunteered that the vehicle was stolen, that he was wanted, and he did not want his family to get involved. Wagner was arrested and taken to the DeWitt County Jail in Clinton, Illinois. While in prison, he wrote letters to the extremist anti-abortion movement looking for support. Wagner struck up a relationship with Reverend Donald Spitz, an independent Pentecostal minister and founder of the anti-abortion group, the Army of God. Clayton informed me that his life was totally committed to taking action against the baby butchers. Clayton was disappointed and dejected because he was apprehended before he was able to fulfill this mission. On December 6, 2000, Clayton Wagner was convicted of federal weapons charges and vehicular theft. During and after the trial, statements reportedly made by Wagner were posted on an anti-abortion website. It doesn't matter to me if you're a nurse, receptionist, or janitor. If you work for a murderous abortionist, I'm going to kill you. As it turned out, Clayton Wagner had no intention of remaining incarcerated. He happened to be put in only one of two cells that had this uh, inside access door to the plumbing. Uh, that was just by chance. He just happened to, uh, at the luck of the draw, uh, end up with that cell. Wagner allegedly picked the lock on that access door with a comb. Police believe a prune juice diet resulted in Wagner losing several pounds. He was now thin enough to squeeze through the small opening and into the crawl space above the cell. From there, authorities theorize Wagner gained access to the roof. Uh. He then jumped to an adjacent building and finally 15 feet to the ground. Wagner allegedly made a beeline for nearby railroad tracks. Wagner knew what time the train went by. He made statements to other inmates that uh, uh, that was going to be his ride. And I think he planned the escape to happen at a certain time so he could jump on that train. Master Patrol, notify dispatch. We got one missing. We conducted uh, searches uh, of the immediate area. We uh, set up roadblocks at all of the uh, exit points uh, leaving the city of Clinton. But there was no sign of Clayton Wagner until two days after the escape. Police received a report that a man matching Wagner's description had stolen a vehicle from a nearby gas station. Although police immediately swarmed the area, Clayton Wagner slipped away yet again. We don't know how Wagner got through that dragnet. Wagner has stated that, that God has made him invisible. I don't think God has made him invisible, but obviously uh, Clayton Wagner is uh, uh, very good at disappearing. Two months after his brazen escape, authorities believe Clayton Wagner resurfaced at a bank outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Surveillance video captured the robber, who made off with $4,700 in cash. I almost couldn't believe it when I saw the photograph. It appeared that uh, the person uh, in the photograph was posing and smiling for the camera, and there was no doubt in my mind it was Clayton Wagner. Wagner has again disappeared possibly into the backwoods of Pennsylvania. Abortion clinics across the country are on full alert, fearing that Clayton Wagner may finally follow through on his threats.
Whether he shoots an abortionist dead or whether he does not shoot an abortionist dead, Clayton will be spending the rest of his life in, in prison if he is apprehended. So Clayton has nothing to lose at this point. Update. On December 5th, 2001, Clayton Wagner was captured by U.S. Marshals in Cincinnati. An employee at a photocopy store recognized him from wanted posters and notified the FBI. Agents moved in and arrested him without incident. Wagner pled guilty to possession of a firearm by a felon and interstate transportation of a stolen vehicle. Tiny infant hospital bracelets, normally the cherished keepsake of the birth of a new baby. But for Patty Lemmer, they are bittersweet. A sad reminder of the bizarre set of events that unfolded over 40 years ago and cost Patty her two young children. My daughters were beautiful, very loving, a um, little bit ornery, like their mother. I don't know, I just love them. They were my life, okay? And uh, my life ended a long time ago. Patty Lammer is desperate for help in finding the daughters taken from her decades ago. In 1959, she was an outcast, divorced and disowned by her family. Sadly, Patty believes she fell prey to people willing to do anything to save her children from the stigma of being raised by a single mother. Good morning. Hi. Patty had no idea of the trouble ahead when she moved to Peoria, Illinois to be near her grandmother. With no money and no job, Patty had to go on welfare and rely on the only relative she had who was willing to help. My grandmother offered to babysit while I was out looking for a job. Mm, love Say you. Bye Stay bye, with mommy. Grammy. I love you. Tell mommy bye bye. I love you. And I thought she treated the girls real well. I had no idea what was going on. Now, Diana, come. I have a special gift for you. Come to find out, she wasn't treating them alike. She was buying Diana toys, clothes, just about anything she wanted, and she just ignored Deborah. Oh, do you like it? Good, good, good. It just hurt her, it just tore her apart. And it was causing problems in our family. Grammy doesn't love me. She After weeks of neglect, five-year-old Deborah became very upset. Patty felt the favoritism was getting out of hand and began to wonder about her grandmother's intentions. She doesn't do anything for me. She loved babies and Deborah was older Grandmother just wanted that chubby little baby. She wanted it for herself. Patty had no choice but to confront her grandmother. If you continue to treat my daughters unequally, I'm not going to allow you to see them again. And she said, you made some pretty bad mistakes in your life, and if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be here, would you? You know damn good well you need me. And I said, that's it. Out. Now. Forget you know us. It was just a few weeks later that Patty received a surprise visit from a social worker. I'd like to talk to you about your two daughters. She had received a complaint that I was beating my girls and not beating them. So I let her interview the girls just to prove that there was nothing wrong. The children were found to be well taken care of. But when Patty asked who made the unfounded claims, she hit a brick wall. She said, that's confidential information and none of your business. And she said, well, I'll tell you this. If we get another call, we will take your children. Decades ago, hearsay and unsubstantiated claims of child abuse could cause a single mother to lose her children. She lived in a culture in which single motherhood was frowned upon. Lots and lots of women were coerced into placing their children by well-meaning social workers and religious officials and parents who thought this is not the right thing for the child or for the mother. Weeks later, the social worker returned. Mrs. Cordova? Yes? She told me that the state was going to take my daughters. If anyone... 
one. And I looked at her and I told her, they'll take him over my dead body. No one is taking my children. No one. Patty's impulse was to run from the lies, and she had an idea who was spreading them. Because I'd had that big blow up with my grandmother, I just know it was her. And she took that secret to the grave, but I know she turned me in. Patty decided to leave Peoria. She asked her girlfriend Doris to watch the girls while she went to nearby Chicago to find work and a new home for her children, Deborah and Diana. But it wasn't long before the system caught up with Patty and her daughters. I had been up there about three days when I got a phone call. Hello? And it was Doris. And uh, she told me my children were gone. She said two people and a sheriff came and got them. Mrs. Cordova. Patty returned to Peoria and was told her children were at Catholic Social Services. Once there, according to Patty, she was met by the Monsignor in charge of her case. He quickly confronted her this with a serious list, list of charges criminal pending. charges against her. You beat your children. You left them alone all night and didn't feed them. You deserted them. And to make matters worse, Finally, Patty claims the only way out of the trumped up allegations was a horrible ultimatum. I need you to sign several documents. If you don't sign, you will go to jail for desertion. What do you answer? If you don't sign the papers, if you go to jail, your children are in an orphanage. If you do sign the papers, they may be adopted. I don't think anybody should have to go through that. Patty felt she had no choice and signed the adoption papers. Curiously, among them were forms she was told were her own daughter's death certificates. The issue of the death certificates was quite bizarre. They wanted to create a new identity for the kids. Clean, whole, this was the model of adoption back then, as if, so that the new parents could raise them as if they gave birth to them. On January 15, 1960, Patty Lemmer saw her three and five-year-old daughters for the last time. I love you so much. Please don't let them take you away. Since their tearful goodbye over 40 years ago, Patty has spent countless hours and thousands of dollars searching for them. Retired from a 17-year career with the Defense Department, Patty dedicates most of her days to looking for clues that might lead to her girls. I promised Deborah and Diana that I'd find them if it took the rest of my life. And that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm not part of their life now, but I want them to know the truth. I've gone through 41 years of hell, and I think I deserve to know my babies are okay. Update. In December of 2001, Unsolved Mysteries received a phone call from a woman whose family had adopted Deborah and Diana. The girls had been placed in the same home shortly after Patty last saw them. Patty has been in telephone contact with her youngest daughter and hopes to meet with both women in the future. At Patty's request, no further information about Deborah or Diana has been released in order to protect their privacy. Join us for our next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.